Deep Modeling and Simulation at Julia Computing, renamed to, to Julia Hub. Uh, what we're doing is we're building uh, Julia Sim, uh, which is a modeling platform. Um, I'll, I'll mention one thing in, in, you know, about that most of the top won't be too much about that. Um, I'm also a research affiliate and co-PI at the Julia Lab at MIT, which builds a lot of open source software and scientific machine learning. I'm also the director of scientific research at a pharmacometrics firm, and I'll be discussing quite a bit about systems biology, systems pharmacology, and how that's being agentized and how so and really the, the core of this talk is how we're taking things that we're doing in scientific machine learning and then bringing them to the agent-based modeling world, right? So, um, so, so let me kind of start this by kind of describing what this, what this regime of agent-based modeling that we are really focusing on, right? It's chemical reaction simulations, specifically things that like di uh, Browning dynamics and RDME simulations. So if you haven't seen these before, um, you can think about them as, you know, you have chemicals moving through little boxels in space. So they have chemical reactions for how things move. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to have, you know, chemical reactions for how a, a piece moves. And then if you have chemicals nearby, they have probabilities and reaction rates for which they are able to react with each other, right? What we're able to do with these is we're able to build spatial models of how biological systems are operating. Like, for example, um, how different proteins are interacting with their endoplasmic reticulum. And then this gives us properties for how different reaction rates will change, you know, the way that a protein binds to the, you know, the, the, these parts of the cell. And then this gives us uh, ways to be able to, you know, develop new drugs or understand better drug targeting, right? And so then this comes back all the way back to pharmacometrics where we could start to develop, you know, understand and develop uh, better drug targets. So a lot of how this is represented is through chemical reaction systems. Um, so here I'm showing the, the catalyst syntax um, where the, these kinds of models are represented by master equations or in the spatial case of reaction diffusion master equation, which essentially is just a master equation that has uh, movement between different uh, voxels as other types of reactions, right? And so, you know, you can think about it as it's, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, the picture there, you know, you can kind of try to understand them as something that looks continuous, right? You know, if you, if I was to tell if you're to just look at this graph, you might think that this uh, that this result or this this model is some kind of continuous object, but in reality, it's not, right? It's something that has discrete values where, you know, you have protein, you know, you, you have these different proteins, P1, P2, P3, and they're changing, they're going up by one to going down by one. So it's, it is an agent-based model. This one is being shown without space. Um, so, but they, you know, but what it basically has is Poisson of uh, processes for how these reaction rates occur. And then when reactions occur, you have uh, reactions going plus one in one protein, minus one in another protein, as specified by the reaction rates and the, and the chemical reaction syntax on the left there. Right. So, so it's this, and the thing that's interesting about these kinds of models is that you can play with them in a very, in a lot of different regimes. So, uh, what we're, what I'm showing here is the catalyst syntax where you can take these kinds of chemical react, that this kind of chemical reaction system and represent it by a approximating ordinary differential equation, which then gives you the mass action kinetics. You can, uh, represent it by what's known as a chemical launch of an equation or a stochastic differential equation. And then you can also represent these as the pure jump form, which we, uh, which, which I described before as a Poisson jump process, right? They give you different levels of granularity for understanding the process and you, the, these molecules, right? Where when you get to the, the jump process area, you're representing every, every chemical agent, where when you go to the ODE side, you're representing concentrations over time, right? And, you know, there, there is a represent, you know, there is a, a, a change between concentrations to, you know, molecules, and that's because you go from continuous to discrete, right? Um, and so what we've been doing for many years now, actually, I think this was one of our first projects in, in, in Julia. I think it started in 2016. We've been developing these, these simulation processes for these RDME and, and, and chemical, uh, chemical master equation simulations. And we've built something that is kind of very uh, fast. It, you know, it's able to outperform a lot of these things like uh, Gillespie and Bionet Gen or Kaposi, if you know this domain. If you don't know this domain, yeah, you can think, you know, well, what we have now is fast simulators for this kind of very specific kind of agent process. And at the same time, we've been building out a separate ecosystem called scientific machine learning. And what I'm going to do with this talk is I'm going to show you how we're kind of merging these two worlds together. So 
the, the, the key idea of what we want to do here, where we want to bring in machine learning is, you know, these ideas of can we discover better re re representations of reaction rates and can we learn better connectivity networks, right? Because when, when I describe this, uh, this, this chemical reaction system, there's actually some very large approximations that are implicit to the formulation of this model, right? So one of the big things is we assume that we know the chemical reaction syst uh, system. Uh, which is generally not true in biology, right? In, in biology, there's hundreds of thousands of proteins, and we kind of say, you know, the, the, the core of how this works is these 20 proteins, which is, you know, very fantastically, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of pride with making that statement, I'll say. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, in a lot of cases, when we're looking at this, bi these biological cases, you know, we want to use things like single cell RNA-seq data and understand, you know, am I missing something? Did, did, is there something about the chemical reaction system that I have not actually modeled that should be within the model, right? But the other thing is that even when we do these models, uh, we use functions like Hill functions that are representative of, of switch-like behavior. Um, and be you know, this is kind of like passed down through the centuries of this is how you do this modeling, but we know analytically that these these are approximations. So in a lot of cases, are there better approximations we should be using for our reaction rate functions? Um, what I want to kind of talk about now then is uh, differentiable simulation and then bridges back to the chemical reaction simulators, right? So, uh, so a lot of what we've been doing simultaneously to the work on chemical reaction uh, networks and, and chemical reaction modeling has been this work on universal differential equations or universal approximators and differential equations. And the, the core idea behind it is if you have some kind of scientific model, you can use the universal approximator property of a neural network to kind of extend the model and model what you do not know. So here, what I'm showing is you know, the, the lock volterra equations where let's say if you only knew, for example, the, the linear relationships in, inside of these, these equations, you can write down the model that you know and then say, well, there are pieces of the model that I don't know. I can represent them by a neural network. You know, a neural network is a universal approximator. It stands in for any RN to RN function sufficiently close as long as you find the right weights. Right, and so what this effectively allows me to do is put a piece in for modeling the functions that I do not know within a, within a model, and use that to kind of learn the the missing physics. And what we showed within the within the universal differential equation work was, you know, a, that you can, for example, do this process where you you specify the equations that you know, so an ordinary differential equation with known equations, and you fill in the unknowns with a neural network where you say, I think that there's something missing here. Please represent a missing function. Um, you train this neural you train this neural network with respect to to time series data, and then what you're able to do from that data is you can uh, then do things like symbolic regression to try to spit out what the missing potential functions are in there, right? So this is this was kind of the key process that we developed uh, for for you know OD basically doing autocomplete of ODE models back in back in 2020. And what we've seen in the last few years from that is that that kind of approach has exploded, especially on ODEs. So one nice case that I like to showcase um, is a, is a set of researchers who use these tools for um, was sent off for uh, understanding binary black holes. So what you're seeing here is that they took the idea of you know, if you have this binary black hole system, um, you can approximate the physics by Newtonian uh, Newtonian equations or Newtonian gravity in a rotating frame. That's say the equations 5a and 5b. Um, but then you can say, well, you know, black holes, they have too large of a mass, so you need relativistic corrections, which are these neural network terms F1, F2, F3, and F4, right? And so this is your universal differential equation where you say, we know Newtonian physics, but we know Newtonian physics is only approximate. Please learn the rest from me. And what they were able to do was use the black hole, uh, the binary black hole data that was from the gravitational waves uh, from the LIGO experiments. Um, and you can see the, the, uh, the points right here. The, so the training data is rather small. Um, the, the predictions are in orange, the, the true data is in uh, blue, and what you can see is that just from a fairly small training data set, they're able to extrapolate forward quite well, right? Um, you know, it's not general relativity well, it's not getting 12 digits of accuracy, but it is getting something that's fairly good for machine learning from such a small data set, right? Um, and so, so this kind of universal differential equation uh, stuff, it have found quite a few use cases. I'm not going to go over all of the work on that. I, I have some other videos on YouTube that describe, you know, 30 different cases of people doing that. So I'm going to just kind of stop right there and say, you know, this, this work has hundreds of citations and check out the citations if you want to see, you know, this, this kind of in action, right? But 
you know, there's other cases where people have done, you know, for this was for earthquake safe buildings. Um, they built this apparatus to be able to do some fine tuned measurements. They built a model of the system. They, if you look at the dotted lines, you see that the, the original physical model did not extrapolate well out, out of uh, uh, as well as they would hope. And then the neural network uh, infused kind of a physical model was able to imp improve the predictions, right? And so the idea here is that, you know, you can kind of use all the information that you have as a starting point and then have neural networks just cover what you did not know. And this is really the, the core of what we call scientific machine learning. Um, we've even put this into different processes now. So there's a form Formula One group uh, that we've been working with and showing that essentially these, you know, peer machine learning kind of Gaussian process approaches, um, you know, if they don't take into account things like, uh, you know, the relationship between momentum and position and, and these kinds of things, you can, you can get some very non-physical results. And so by using physical knowledge in, inside of these, uh, inside of the, the, way, what, the way that things are learned, you can get much better results from the, from the same amount of data, right? So this is really the core of scientific machine learning, these universal differential equations. And in the ODE case, we pretty well established that, you know, you can use all of your prior knowledge and extend it. But what we want to do now, and, you know, what I want to do uh, now is I want to talk about, you know, well, can we do this kind of extension thing where we we take chemical reactions that we know and extend them? Can we do this in that purely agent-based kind of world, right? And the first thing to understand is that this really requires differentiation to work well, right? Um, and, and so, you know, you can try to get away without differentiation, but, you know, using techniques like deep reinforcement learning, though I'm pretty sure most people here know that you know, the reason why deep reinforcement learning is such a great research area is because today it's fairly expensive computationally and data-wise, right? Um, there's a lot of downfalls to read deep reinforcement learning. I would say that the the, the post uh, blog post on deep reinforcement learning doesn't work yet. That is a great post if uh, someone here hasn't read it yet. Um, so I would, I would point to you to, to the sources on this, but basically deep reinforcement learning and a lot of these derivative free techniques have a lot of difficulty scaling. Um, they actually have a scaling property that's like the uh, square root. And so a lot of people try to look towards derivative based methods in order to, to improve this. Now within the scientific machine learning cases, we have some concrete evidence um, about why this is really the case. So uh, I think that a very nice uh, study was when we were doing universal differential equations for um, improving climate models, uh, we, we came up with this kind of step-by-step -step process that showed the, the effect of differentiability. So the purpose that what we were doing here was trying to find one-dimensional partial differential equation models that approximates the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, right? Because the 3D Navier-Stokes equations can be too expensive to be able to, you know, put all over the whole world because the ocean's rather big. Um, and so when you have a big model of water, you need simple water models, right? Um, now, when you try to do this process, right, well, well, you can do uh, a simple integral approximation with a closure. And so if you don't have this neural network, it's what's called a convective adjustment term. Um, this is what's done in a lot of climate models today. But then this neural network is capturing the term, the higher order terms that would be lopped off. Um, and what we can do here is we could say, well, we want to learn this 1D model to approximate the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations. And... What we can do is we can take the, the flux data at every single point in time, and we can say, well, this neural network is some residual to the heat flux, and we can build a data set of you know, re heat flux residuals versus heat fluxes and directly learn that. Um, that and then after we've learned the neural net, trained this neural network, we stick it into the simulator. And what we see, what happens when we do that is we have errors that kind of grow over time with this drift. Now, why is that the case? Well, one way to understand this is be that when we train the neural network like this, when we, when we train a neural network outside of the simulation and uh, to be able to kind of uh, fit this closure term and then stick it in, what's going on is we're trying to fit, make this neural network train to uh, you know, fix or control the derivative. And what we see is we get a drift over time. Now, that shouldn't be too surprising. I mean, if there's you know, controls engineers around here, uh, what I'm saying is that we try to control the derivative and we saw drift. Uh, that's exactly what you'd expect from control theory. And so the way that you fix that is you'd actually have to control the integral, right? Um, and so what we see is that if we define our loss function instead to, instead of using the heat flux, if we instead use the temperature itself at every, uh, or the average temperature along horizontal slices itself, what we see is that we get a much more stable uh, fitting process. In fact, it gets us about two orders of magnitude better predictions. Um, so this tells us that, you know, 
there are ways, you know, re deep reinforcement learning and, and uh, you know, being training a neural network outside of a simulator and then sticking it in. There are ways to be able to get around trying to do differentiable simulation, but you lose orders of magnitude in, in, in the performance, of, or you lose order of magnitude in the fit, um, in the accuracy of the fit. Also, it ends up being very slow. And so we really have to, you know, what we found from this research then is that if we want to do the scientific machine learning process, if we want to integrate neural networks with our simulators, then we really need to be able to differentiate our simulators, right? And so can we generalize differentiable simulation beyond continuous models, right? Because I started this talk by talking about this, uh, this agent-based kind of um, chemical reaction simulation with RDMEs. And then I went through all these cases showing, hey, you know, we can do really cool things with machine learning mixed with simulators with ODEs and stochastic differential equations, right? But can we, can we go beyond continuous models, right? So one of the first cases that we were looking at was that something that kind of falls in the middle between an ODE and a probabilistic model. And that's a chaotic system, right? Because in, in general, chaotic system, uh, while you can write it down as though it's something that you can numerically solve, in practice, you can either any small amount of numerical error blows up so fast that you can really only understand it as a chaotic system. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole mathematics behind this, but it turns out that you can change the way that you do automatic differentiation for chaotic systems to the point where even though you cannot do uh, trust the forward pass at all, um, you can still differentiate the system with respect to probabilistic quantities. This is something that we call the, the shadow adjoints. Right, and the and shadowing square these squares, um, and so you can check out uh, Frank's blog post on, that describes these shadowing methods for how you can do differentiation in these cases that are kind of mixed about probabilistic continuous. Now going even further, we had a recent uh, paper at at NeurIPS which describes how you can kind of take any of these discrete stochastic models and generate a differentiating process. And the core idea behind it is as follows, right? So traditional automatic differentiation, the way that you differentiate a process is you is you take a code that does, you know, f of p that takes in a parameter and spits out a value. You take a code that does that does that and you generate a new code that gives you the derivative of the original code with respect to the parameter, right? So that's how general automatic differentiation works, back propagation, right? It takes a code that produces an output and it bring, gives you a code that produces a derivative, right? What we were looking at doing then is you know, hey, we have an agent-based model. And if we have an agent-based model, then what we have instead is we have a random variable, right? So if you think about this as I have a code that represents a random variable that has a parameter P. Like say, flip a coin with respect and, you know, it has a probability P of being heads. And what I want to do now is I want to have a new form of unmet differentiation, which takes in, uh, which takes in, which takes this, this code that I had before for the random variable, and generates a new random variable, X tilde, which has the property that the expected pre value of x tilde is the derivative of the expected value of the original problem. Uh, yeah, right? So I want to build it. So this is very key here. I want to build a stochastic process whose expectation has the properties that I want, right? And why would I do that? Well, because a lot of times when we're doing this training, right, we have our loss function taken, uh, our loss function uses the expected value of our original process. And so this gives me an, an agent-based model, essentially, that would generate derivatives of the original agent-based model's expected values, right? So it gives me a new agent-based model, right? It's still a stochastic model, but its expectations have the property that they act like the derivatives of the expected values of my original one. And the way that you can do this, and, you know, this is going to be kind of quick, um, but the way that you can do this is if you have... What you essentially have to do is you go, okay, there, there's two types of infinitesimals that happen in, in the agent-based space, right? I have it. I have infinitesimal changes that, uh, that cause inf inf infinitesimal changes in the output, right? This occurs when I have uh, probability distributions or variables that are continuous. And this works according to standard automatic differentiation, right? So if you, if you use like a stochastic differential equation solver and if you use automatic differentiation on that, uh, there's nothing you have to ch change, right? And so continuous processes with continuous noise, you know, de Brownian motions and things like that, derivatives with respect to parameters do work out. Um, and this paper actually then proves that, right? So, but the, the, the difficult thing though, is to understand how do you deal with infinitesimals or, or infinitesimal changes for discrete variables. So, you know, for example, if I have a Bernoulli random variable, uh, you know, when I have a, 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 a coin flip, you know, probability P of being heads, right? And I want to take the derivative with respect to P, right? Well, 
there's no infinitesimal change that you can kind of do there, right? It's either you get heads or tails, you know, and there's not little, you know, heads a little bit or tails a little bit, right? You know, there, so you have to always have a discrete value. So how do you define a derivative in this case? And what we, what we came up with was this idea of, well, even though you have a, you know, e even though you have these values that are discrete, you still have a way to understand and, and incorporate some kind of inf infinitesimals because you have a, you can have an infinitesimal probability of changing the output, right? So you can say, I have, a, a, you know, I flipped this coin and I had heads, but there was an infinitesimal probability that I could have instead had tails, right? And this becomes the core behind the method where you can essentially run the, these, these agent-based models, but there is a, a there is a, a essentially a, um, there is essentially a probability distribution that we have that, that over time, that is, well, if I got heads, then this is the probability that that heads could have flipped the tails. And if I had tails, this is the infinitesimal probability that it could have switched to heads, right? And you can then run your agent-based model in such a way that you are doing things most of the same, but at a given point in time, you can choose to take one of these alternative paths where the probability of taking this alternative path is with respect to that probability of potentially doing that change. Now, how you calculate that probability, go see the paper for the exact details. But what you get in the end is you essentially are, uh, have a way of t uh, taking a code that, that runs a model into something that now runs the model and it runs the model normally to, to a given spot and then kind of branches the model to run two of them and then differences them at the end, right? And so what this what this means then is that since most of the case is all the same, it's even the same random number generation, a lot of the same path, you have a very low variance estimate of the derivative, which gives you a lot faster convergence. And that that really has been the key to this. So um, if you if you read the paper in detail, you'll see that this actually comes down to just an algebra. So if you know forward mode automatic differentiation, you can use dual number arithmetic to define how to do forward mode automatic differentiation. What we show is that there's an extension to forward mode automatic differentiation differentiation that applies to these uh, the, to these discrete stochastic cases where you have your primal form right and then you have your infinitesimal this so this is this is the standard dual number in in uh in uh in forward mode automatic differentiation but you can then say i have a component that is respect to discrete changes right and so this thing shows it in action right so let's say you're trying to differentiate the function uh the random variable x of p Right, so what you do, just like forward mode automatic differentiation, you would seed it with the value, you know, epsilon. Right, we have one inside of the derivative term, and what comes out would be then then the derivative with respect to that output. Right, um, and so, you know, you can see that you know when when you when you square it, you do the same thing as the multiplication rule. So a lot of this thing follows similarly to forward mode automatic differentiation with dual numbers. If you haven't seen forward mode automatic differentiation with dual numbers, we have other talks that that go into that. But really, the key here is that when you when you hit this with a with with a discrete probability distribution, like say here I have take a binomial, uh, I want to take a binomial with this with respect to this probability p, right? What you end up having is you, you get a number out, right? So it, it it takes a random value, so it says okay, you know if the value of p right now is zero point three six, I take a random value with a six, right? But I also have a pro an infinitesimal probability of going plus one, right? Um, and so th this is this is what it's then then doing. It, it basically says, okay, I have you know I'm still running a stand my standard simulation in the primal, but I have a derivative term that is telling me how I could branch off. And then there there's this this process which is the the printing process and the smoothing process for how we choose when to take these branches. And if you do this correctly, then the uh, then what comes out inside of your 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 derivative terms um, in, with the epsilon terms, this actually then correctly gives you the derivative with respect to the expected value. And you can actually see this in action here, where we show that if you put a stochastic triple with the value of 0 0.6 into this ex uh, random variable, you get uh, derivatives of the expectation with a, with a low variance out from very few samples, right? So it's essentially an extension of automatic differentiation to this case where you now have binomials, Poisson distributions, and, and Bernoulli distributions differentiating with respect to the parameters that, that define those distributions. Um, and again, you know, just like automatic differentiation, you just put this into, into arbitrary code, like agent-based models, and then it's able to spit out these derivatives with respect to expectations.
And so what we're able to show then is that on on these kind of extensions of um, of so so here's one case that we we're looking at, which is a um, a stochastic game of life, right? So it's like Conway's game of life, except it has probabilities of of activations. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to take the derivative of the result with respect to these probabilities of activations, be able to force the system, uh, you know, to choose probabilities that 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 do something we want, right? And what we're able to show is that this is able to give us some very uh, some some derivatives that have very low st uh, standard uh, uh, standard deviations or, or variances. So it, it's essentially able to take derivatives or, or find derivatives with respect to expectations in a way that very much outperforms uh, score function techniques. And the core to this is that it's a low variance, but also unbiased technique for, for doing this by using this kind of, of, of approach that I described. Um, and so I think that that's, that's about it, and then I'm, I'm about time there. And so really what we've been doing at the scientific, at the SIMO organization is this process of building simulators and then also building ways to compute the derivatives. What I described here is a way to extend automatic differentiation to agent-based models and the use case that we're doing this for, which is the chemical reaction networks. Uh, we're not all done with, with putting it all together, right? So you can see the paper that we have on the chemical reaction simulator. You can see the paper that we have on the stochastic automatic differentiation. But what we're doing next, of course, is what I described, which is using this to be able to find, you know, better representation, so functions of, you know, being able to essentially train neural networks uh, as rate, rate reactions within these chemical reaction networks using these new ways of calculating derivatives. So yeah, thank you very much. And I'll take uh, any questions you have.